Hello and welcome to this edition of Wineskins. I'm Father Jim Cordell. Wineskins is a program that features reflections on the lives of the saints and the sacred scriptures, along with a variety of issues and topics, all from a Catholic perspective. Wineskins is brought to you through the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our program today, I will interview Monsignor David Rhodes. We will also hear more information on St. Aloysius Gonzaga, and today, as the Church celebrates a feast of the Most Holy Trinity, we will get a deeper insight into those particular Sunday readings. That and more on Wineskins. And now I will speak with one of the new transitional deacons of the Diocese of Youngstown. Joining me now is Deacon Matthew Hummerkhaus. Welcome to Wineskins. Thank you. You know, we were talking before the taping that you were with us about three years ago. Right. So a lot has happened for you and in your life the last three years. Tell us some of those great things that have happened. I got to spend a, a whole year at St. Christine's in Youngstown here, and I learned just so many things about ministry and that's really the the thing about the internship year is we get all the seasons, you know, we get Christmas and all the stuff that usually like we don't get in the summertime when nothing really happens in the summertime in the parish. So mm. parish council doesn't meet, no finance council. You don't really decorate for anything. It's just a bunch of weeks of ordinary time, really. Hmm. Tell us uh, what in your pastoral experiences last year that you found the most challenging, something that you really had to work and struggle at. I'm a, a bit of an introvert, naturally, just coming out of myself and like just being around a lot of people all the time. And then finding that balance where usually in the evening I go and, and I have to be alone just to, to recharge or else the next day is, is kind of hard. You know, as you look forward this next year to priesthood, mm -hmm. what are some of the things that you're really looking forward to doing as a priest? Well, I've said this since the beginning is I just, I love the people and I love the sacraments, especially the Eucharist and reconciliation. Those are the important things I think that are going to be part of my ministry and what I'm really going to stress. You know, one of the words that we don't often use for ourselves as deacons or priests is that we're evangelists, but we really are. Oh, we're yeah. to tell the good news and to show the good news and to embody the good news. How and what would you tell the folks that are with us? that they can do to be evangelists? To be a good evangelist, it doesn't take, you don't have to have an intimate knowledge of the scripture or papal documents or anything. You just have to live a life of love towards other people. It's really just, it's so simple. Like we want to make it difficult. We just live a life of love. That's the best evangelization, I think. Well, you know, it's interesting as you mentioned that, one thing that comes to mind is that in your life experience, you've learned many things along the way. What are some of the things that you've learned that helped you now as a deacon and subsequently as a priest? I would say one of the biggest things that has influenced me would be the time that I spent before seminary in like construction and landscaping and just working and experiencing real life. And I got to know how to just interact with people in a normal way as in, like an adult. So just normal interactions. You are just finishing up your pastoral year at St. Christine, correct? Or you have finished I had, up your, I had there, your pastoral yeah. year. I was at St. Christine back in the middle 80s okay. uh, for a couple of years as an associate, but also working here at the TV station. So I had some wonderful experiences at St. Christine. What stands out to you about the people there in that parish at St. Christine? You know what I see that really stands out is a lot of joy. People just seem genuinely happy to be there and to experience the liturgy and individuals come to mind that really they throw themselves into the other ministries of the church like Christ Renews His Parish and RCIA and things like that. And people are, they're very involved and they're very happy. Deacon Matthew Humberkhaus, we thank you for being with us today. Thanks for We especially me. thank you for your vocation. Yes. And we pray for you as you continue this final year in preparation for priesthood. God's blessing and Godspeed. Thank you. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. St. Aloysius Gonzaga was a religious. To tell us more is Tom McCarthy. He is from St. Charles Church in Boardman. St. Aloysius Gonzaga was a saintly seminarian who died in Rome in 1591. 
and was canonized in 1726. He was born of a noble family in Italy, and his father earnestly wanted him to become a soldier. At the age of 10, Aloysius consecrated himself to God with a vow of virginity. He received his first communion at the age of 12 from the hands of St. Charles Borromeo. On November 25, 1585, he entered the Jesuit novitiate in Rome. He lived there for six years with St. Robert Bellarmine as his spiritual director. He received his minor orders from St. John Lanterin and continued to prepare himself for the priesthood, dreaming of the foreign missions and even martyrdom. During the plague of 1591, he nursed the sick, and like several other members of the Jesuit community, he contracted the disease, but never recovered from it. He died at midnight between June 20th and 21st, with the name of Jesus on his lips. The revised prayers of the Mass refer to the three characteristics of this young Jesuit, whom Pope Paul XI named Patron of Youth in 1926. First of all, the opening prayer states that in St. Aloysius, God combined remarkable innocence with the spirit of penance. We then ask that we who have not yet followed his innocence may follow his example of penance. Although Aloysius accused himself of being a sinner, the fact is he never sustained his baptismal innocence. He followed a schedule of austerity and mortification from which he did not deviate even when he served at court. After he entered the Society of Jesus, he became even more austere. In the prayer over the gifts, we find a second characteristic of Aloysius. We ask that we may always come to the Eucharist with hearts free of sin. The Latin version of this prayer speaks of the wedding garment of St. Aloysius. Hence, the second characteristic of St. Aloysius is that he was clothed in charity. So intense was his love of God that he frequently fell into ecstasy, not only in the chapel, but sometimes at meals or during the recreation period. The same charity prompted him to serve the sick and the needy and to have a preference to the poor and the lowly in spite of his noble heritage. The third characteristic is the prayer after communion where, after referring to the bread of life, we ask that we may serve God without sin and spend our lives in thanksgiving. The description of Aloysius is angelic in the former liturgy and has been omitted so that the young saint would appear more human and not ingenuously innocent. In a letter to his mother, in the Office of Readings, after speaking of his impending death, he concludes, I write all this with the one desire that you and all my family may consider my departure a joy and favor, and that you especially may speed with a mother's blessing my passage across the waters to where I reach the shore to which all hope belongs. The opening prayer of the Mass reads, Father of love, giver of all good things, in St. Aloysius you combined remarkable innocence with the spirit of penance. By the help of his prayers, may we who have not followed his innocence follow in his example of penance. For Wineskins, I'm Tom McCarthy. We're talking with Monsignor David Rhodes and we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Diocese of Youngstown. You know, one of the highlights of my priesthood was my first assignment. And that was with you and that was yes. your first pastorate at St. Joe's in Canton. Uh, yes. And talk briefly about that beginning for you as, as your first pastorate, what that was like, and the kind of church that we found ourselves in. Well, that was, of course, back in 1979, and I had been a priest uh, 12 years. Uh, in those days, priests usually served as an assistant pastor or associate pastor in a parish for about 10, 12 years before he became a pastor. It's totally different now. Right. So I remember telling Bishop Malone that I wanted to serve in the chancery. I was willing to serve there for 10 years, but then I wanted to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. To me, that was the goal of being a diocesan priest. So I was privileged to be appointed to St. Joseph's Parish in Canton, and you became my associate. Mm -hmm. 
It was an exciting time. I'll never forget my first days there, being very excited about mm -hmm. this new mission that I had and could I do it, and then implementing changes that needed to be done at that mm -hmm. parish and mm -hmm. in all the parishes that came out of the Second Vatican Councils. I have fond memories of that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go back a little further than that. Talk about your home parish, which we know is Immaculate Conception in Ravenna, yes. but then there's roots in other places, and talk briefly about that. I'm a son of the Immaculate Conception Parish in Ravenna. That's where I grew up, mm -hmm. and that's where I celebrated my first Mass in 1965. But I've always considered myself a grandson of St. Joseph Parish in Randolph, Suffield. Uh, that's one of the oldest parishes in the diocese, right. going back to 1832. Mm -hmm. My ancestors were among some of the founders mm -hmm. of that parish, mm -hmm. both my mother and my father's side. When I say I'm a grandson of the parish, I mean that all four of my grandparents grew up there. They're buried there. Mm -hmm. So I feel a part of that history, and it's a very interesting history. We did a spot about St. Joseph in Mogador, and we know that it was really the first parish founded in Portage County, but also its school yes. uh, is significant, and the Lord Shrine. Talk about the school. Well, the school could. is reputed to be the oldest Catholic school west of the Allegheny Mountains. Now, I don't know if you can prove that, yeah. but it's always said because it was begun in 1832. Mm -hmm. In fact, they built the school a couple of years before they built a church. Yeah. It's also interesting that they called it an English Catholic school mm -hmm. because though they were predominantly German uh, and French, as my ancestors were, they wanted to be American and they wanted to mm -hmm. identify as English speaking. And it so happens that my uh, great-great-grandfather, his name was Joseph Schrader. Mm -hmm. He was an immigrant from Oldenburg in Germany in the north. He was the first school teacher there. And uh, so I'm kind of proud of that. Sure. And that school's still in existence, mm -hmm. still going. The other interesting thing about it is we take for granted that nuns would be in schools. Well, nuns never went to that school until 50-some years later when the Sisters of Notre Dame mm -hmm. came from Cleveland to teach in that school. So for the first 50-some years of its existence, it was staffed by lay people. A one-room school, there's probably sure. only one teacher, but mm -hmm. I think yeah. we need to remember that. That, sure. too, is similar to what we have now. Yeah. In your many years as a diocesan priest, have there been any particular person that has influenced or inspired you over the years, whether it's in your vocation or as a leader in the church, anyone that stands out or any persons that stand out that you'd like to share with oh, us? Oh, that's, that's hard to answer because certainly preeminent would be my parents and my family. They were extraordinary influence, uh, you know, just mm -hmm. living the faith as they did. Certainly going to a Catholic school, I was taught by Dominican sisters, they had an impact. And then I could name priests who also encouraged me. And it's hard to answer that in one by naming any one person. I couldn't do that. Sure. You know, over our conversations, we've talked briefly about some of those changes that have really affected our diocesan church, but also the church in the United States and perhaps even around the world. One of the things that we experience is really a, what we call fewer priest situation. What has been your experience? Of course, when you were first ordained, there was a plethora of diocesan and priests. Now those numbers are much smaller. In your experience and also in your thought, why is that and what can we look forward to in the future? First, I would want to say that I met some of the young men studying for the priesthood and I'm impressed with the quality of the men that I've met. I just trust that we are certainly, our diocese, I understand, is doing, in terms of numbers, is doing as well as anybody else in this part of the world. So I'm just confident and trustful that that will continue. It will be a different way of ministering to people with fewer priests, but we'll continue to do it. There are a lot of reasons that we could address a married clergy, possibility of ordination of women, certainly the diaconate. Church needs to be open to those and other possibilities. We know that you were very instrumental in coming up with the diocesan theme for the 75th anniversary. What was that all about? With pride in the past, 
oh, I don't know. When I have nothing to do, I like to imagine <laughs> things. So uh, I don't know how I came up with that. Okay. But uh, and, thank and faith you for, in the future. Let's talk briefly about that. Well, faith you in always the there always has to be faith in the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Bishop Fenwick became the Bishop of Cincinnati in 1821 as the Apostle of Ohio, there were six priests mm -hmm. for the whole Ohio plus that he had as a diocese, and they were all Dominicans. Mm -hmm. One of them was his nephew. So look what he faced, mm -hmm. and yet, talk about the mustard seed, you know, being the smallest of seeds but growing into a great shrub or bush, mm -hmm. and we just have to live on confident that trusting that that will continue to be the case. Father David Rhodes, thank you so much for sharing your time with us, but also your expertise and your wealth of knowledge about the history of the diocese and also Catholicism here in Northeastern Ohio. Okay, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Have a good day and God be with you. For more pertinent information and to listen to Wineskins, visit www.doy.org, the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Available through St. Paul's Books and Gifts is a small treatise on peace of heart, both in book and audiobook form, by author Father Jacques Philippe, well-known preacher and retreatant from France. For more information on this item and many more, please visit the bookstore at 926 Boardman Canfield Road in Boardman or call 330-953-2443 or visit their website at www.stpaulsusa.com. This book, Searching for and Maintaining Peace, is there to help you pursue peace of heart as a pure gift of God. Again, that phone number is 330-953-2443 or visit their website at www.stpaulsusa.com. Church World Service believes that being self-reliant is a joy everyone should share. So around the block or around the world, share the joy. Hello, I'm Bishop George Murray. As we begin our annual Bishop's Appeal in the Diocese of Youngstown, I am reminded of the many church ministries supported by our efforts. Through our goal of $4.2 million, we can continue to do the work of Catholic charities and evangelization, provide quality education and ministry to our seminarians, youth and young adults, offer pastoral services to our sisters and brothers through the Office of Hispanic Ministry, promote pro-life activities, and even share the faith through radio and television in our telecommunications efforts. Please join us through your prayer, financial contributions, or volunteerism to achieve our goal in this year. Thirty-three million Americans have descended into poverty, and as their futures fall, so does our nations. Our song today is from the CD called In His Presence. It is by the Kellenberg Memorial High School Choir.
As we celebrate this Feast of the Most Holy Trinity, we will hear more about the Sacred Scriptures by Deacon Mike Kajancic. He is from St. Charles Church in Boardman. I taught special needs for 30 years. And in all those years, I loved the moment when the eyes of the students would sparkle. After days or weeks of explaining, showing, and teaching them some skill that they needed, and they would try and try, but just not grasp it, it was all of a sudden, it all came together, It all made sense. They knew what we were talking about. Their eyes sparkled. I wonder if Jesus' eyes lit up when after three years of talking about and showing them how to live the faith, it all came together for his disciples. Today's gospel comes from the Last Supper discourse. Jesus knows time is short, very short. And now, just before the darkest moments of his earthly ministry, he realizes they still don't get it. But he also knows the Father can provide what's missing, which is why he proclaims to them, when he comes, the Spirit of truth will guide you to all truth. They needed a spark from heaven. The Spirit then, to have it all make sense, came at Pentecost. We need the Spirit now, to have it all make sense, make sense of life, of faith, and have it come together. We are told to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. Heart and soul is easy, but it's more difficult when it comes to the mind. We humans like to think things out, to rationalize, explore other possibilities, like to investigate both the positive and the negative, usually focusing on the negative. To surrender all that we have, all that we are, our heart, soul, and mind, is why we need the spirit of truth, to blend our lives, our minds, our very way of thinking all together to have it all make sense. Many years ago, I came across the beautiful image of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and how they work as one. The image said to think of bread, ordinary bread, which basically consists of wheat, water, and fire. Now, water is one of the primary symbols of baptism, used to welcome us, having been made cleansed into God's family. The wheat reminds us of the Eucharist, the spiritual food we need for this journey of faith. But water and wheat are not enough. You simply can't mix them together. Something more is needed for completion, to blend the ingredients into the very substance of life, hence the fire. In a similar way, the Holy Spirit, through our reception of this sacrament of confirmation, completes our initiation into the faith, which began with our baptism 
and is nourished through our reception of the Eucharist. Blending all that we have learned and practiced, we continue to learn and practice throughout our lives in order to be God's faithful children. Our heart, our soul, our mind comes to know and be guided by the truth of the Spirit, the fire that enlightens us. This is what we celebrate today on this Feast of the Most Holy Trinity, the gift that is God Himself that will make our hearts, minds, and souls one with Him. For Wineskins, I'm Deacon Mike Kojancic. The things that you and I really know about God, we have actually learned from people that we know and love. God is love. We all know that His love becomes more real for us when we experience it in the lives of other people. Wineskins is a production of CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. It is brought to you by the Annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda, wishing you a beautiful week. And CTNY would like to extend our prayers and best wishes to all the dads on this Father's Day. have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. What have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. They say America is the land of opportunity, but for some, life isn't so easy. Right now in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. That's nearly 13 million children of all races all across our country. Where do you draw the line and get involved? You can make a difference in more ways than you think. Go to povertyusa.org today, because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development.